Public Speaking by Dale Carnegie and Joseph Berg Asenwein. Section 35, Appendix D, Speeches for Study and Practice. Newell Dwight Hillis, Brave Little Belgium. Delivered in Plymouth Church, Brooklyn, New York, October 18, 1914. Used by permission. Long ago, Plato made a distinction between the occasions of war and the causes of war. The occasions of war lie upon the surface and are known and read of all men, while the causes of war are embedded in racial antagonisms, in political and economic controversies. Narrative historians portray the occasions of war, philosophic historians the secret and hidden causes. Thus the spark of fire that falls is the occasion of an explosion, but the cause of the havoc is the relation between charcoal, nitre, and saltpeter. The occasion of the Civil War was the firing upon Fort Sumter. The cause was the collision between the ideals of the Union, presented by Daniel Webster, and the succession taught by Calhoun. The occasion of the American Revolution was the stamp tax. The cause was the conviction, on the part of our forefathers, that men who had freedom in worship carried also the capacity for self-government. The occasion of the French Revolution was the purchase of a diamond necklace for Queen Marie Antoinette at a time when the treasury was exhausted. The cause of the revolution was feudalism, not otherwise the occasion of the great conflict that is now shaking our earth was the assassination of an Austrian boy and girl, but the cause is embedded in racial antagonisms and economic competition. As for Russia, the cause of the war was her desire to obtain the Bosphorus and an open seaport, which is the prize offered for her attack upon Germany. As for Austria, the cause of the war is her fear of the growing power of the Balkan states and the progressive slicing away of her territory. As for France, the cause of the war is the instinct of self-preservation that resists an invading host. As for Germany, the cause is her deep-seated conviction that every country has a moral right to the mouth of its greatest river, unable to compete with England by roundabout sea routes and a keel canal, she wants to use the route that nature digged for her through the mouth of the Rhine. As for England, the motherland is fighting to recover her sense of security. During the Napoleonic Wars, the second William Pitt explained the quadrupling of the taxes, the increase of the navy, and the sending of an English army against France by the statement that justification of this proposed war is the preservation of England's sense of security. Ten years ago, England lost her sense of security. Today she is not seeking to preserve, but to recover the lost sense of security. She proposes to do this by destroying Germany's ironclads, demobilizing her army, wiping out her forts, and the partition of her provinces. The occasions of the war vary with the color of the paper, white and gray and blue. But the causes of this war are embedded in racial antagonisms and economic and political differences. Why Little Belgium Has the Center of the Stage Tonight our study concerns Little Belgium, her people, and their part in this conflict. Be the reasons what they may, this little land stands in the center of the stage and holds the limelight. Once more David, armed with a sling, has gone up against ten Goliaths. It is an amazing spectacle, this, one of the smallest of the states battling with the largest of the giants. Belgium has a standing army of 42,000 men, and Germany, with three reserves, perhaps seven million or eight million. Without waiting for any assistance, this little Belgian band went up against two million. 
It is as if a honey bee had decided to attack an eagle come to loot its honeycomb. It is as if an antelope had turned against a lion. Belgium has but 11,000 square miles of land, less than the states of Massachusetts, Rhode Island, and Connecticut. Her population is 7,500,000, less than the single state of New York. You could put 22 Belgiums in our single state of Texas. Much of her soil is thin. Her handicaps are heavy. But the industry of her people has turned the whole land into one vast flower and vegetable garden. The soil of Minnesota and the Dakotas is new soil, and yet our farmers there average but 15 bushels of wheat to the acre. Belgium's soil has been used for centuries, but it averages 37 bushels of wheat to the acre. If we grow 24 bushels of barley on an acre of ground, Belgium grows 50. She produces 300 bushels of potatoes, where the main farmer harvests 90 bushels. Belgium's average population per square mile has risen to 645 people. If Americans practiced intensive farming, if the population of Texas were as dense as it is in Belgium, 100 million of the United States, Canada, and Central America could all move to Texas. While if our entire country was as densely populated as Belgium's, everybody in the world could live comfortably within the limits of our country. The life of the people. And yet little Belgium has no gold or silver mines, and all the treasures of copper and zinc and lead and anthracite and oil have been denied her. The gold is in the heart of her people. No other land holds a race more prudent, industrious, and thrifty. It is a land where everybody works. In the winter, when the sun does not shine until half-past seven, the Belgian cottages have lights in their windows at five, and the people are ready for an eleven-hour day. As a rule, all children work after twelve years of age. The exquisite pointed lace that has made Belgium famous is wrought by women who fulfill the tasks of the household fulfilled by American women, and then begins their task upon the exquisite lace that have sent their name and fame throughout the world. Their wages are low, their work hard, but their life is so peaceful and prosperous that few Belgians ever emigrate to foreign countries. Of late they have made their education compulsory, their schools free. It is doubtful whether any other country has made a greater success of their system of transportation. You will pay fifty cents to journey some twenty-odd miles out to Roslyn on our Long Island Railroad. But in Belgium, a commuter journeys twenty miles into the factory and back again every night and makes the six double daily journeys at an entire cost of thirty-seven and one-half cents per week, less than the amount that you pay for the journey one way for a like distance in this country. Out of this has come Belgium's prosperity. She has the money to buy goods from other countries, and she has the property to export to foreign lands. Last year, the United States, with its hundred millions of people, imported less than two thousand million dollars, and exported two thousand five hundred million dollars. If our people had been as prosperous per capita as Belgium, we would have purchased from other countries twelve thousand million dollars worth of goods, and exported ten thousand million dollars. So largely have we been dependent upon Belgium that many of the engines used in digging the Panama Canal came from the cockerel works that produced two thousands of these engines every year in Liège. It is often said that the Belgians have the best courts in existence. 
The Supreme Court of Little Belgium has but one justice. Without waiting for an appeal, just as soon as the decision has been reached by a lower court, while the matters are still fresh in mind and all the witnesses and facts readily obtainable, this Supreme Justice reviews all the objections raised on either side, and without a motion from any one, passes on the decision of the inferior court. On the other hand, the lower courts are open to an immediate settlement of disputes between the wage earners, and newsboys and fishermen are almost daily seen going to the judge for a decision regarding a dispute over five or ten cents. When the judge has cross-questioned both sides, without the presence of attorneys, or the necessity of serving a process, or raising a dollar and a quarter, as here, the poorest of the poor have their wrongs righted. It is said that not one decision out of one hundred is appealed, thus calling for the existence of an attorney. To all other institutions organized in the interest of the wage earner has been added the National Savings Bank system that makes loans to men of small means, that enables the farmer and the working man to buy a little garden and build a house, while at the same time insuring the working man against accident and sickness. Belgium is a poor man's country, it has been said, because institutions have been administered in the interest of the men of small affairs. The Great Belgian Plain in History But the institutions of Belgium and the industrial prosperity of her people alone are not equal to the explanation of her unique heroism. Long ago, in his commentaries, Julius Caesar said that Gaul was inhabited by three tribes, the Belgae, the Aquitani, the Celts, of whom the Belgae were the bravest. History will show that Belgians have courage as their native right, for only the brave could have survived. The southeastern part of Belgium is a series of rock plains, and if these plains have been her good fortune in times of peace, they have furnished the battlefields of Western Europe for 2,000 years. Northern France and Western Germany are rough, jagged, and wooded. But the Belgian plains were ideal battlefields. For this reason, the generals of Germany and of France have usually met and struggled for the mastery on these wide Belgian plains. On one of these grounds, Julius Caesar won the first battle that is recorded. Then came King Clovis and the French with their campaigns. Toward these plains also the Saracens were hurrying when assaulted by Charles Martel. On the Belgian plains the Dutch burghers and the Spanish armies, led by Bloody Alva, fought out their battle. Hither, too, came Napoleon, and the great mound of Waterloo is the monument to the Duke of Wellington's victory. It was to the Belgian plains also that the German general, last August, rushed his troops. Every college and every city searches for some level spot of land where the contest between opposing teams may be held, and for more than two thousand years the Belgian plain has been the scene of the great battles between the warring nations of Western Europe. Now, out of all these collisions there has come a hardy race, inured to peril, rich in fortitude, loyalty, patience, thrift, self-reliance, and persevering faith. For five hundred years the Belgian children and youth have been brought up upon the deeds of noble renown achieved by their ancestors. If Julius Caesar were here today, he would wear Belgium's bravery like a bright sword girded to his thigh. And when this brave little people, with a standing army of 42,000 men, 
single-handed defied two millions of Germans. It tells us that Ajax has come back once more to defy the god of lightnings. A thrilling chapter from Belgium's history. Perhaps one or two chapters torn from the pages of Belgium history will enable us to understand her present-day heroism, just as one golden bough plucked from the forest will explain the richness of the autumn. You remember that Venice was once the financial center of the world. Then, when the bankers lost confidence in the navy of Venice, they put their jewels and gold into saddlebags and moved the financial center of the world to Nuremberg because its walls were seven feet thick and twenty feet high. Later, about 1500 A.D., the discovery of the new world turned all the peoples into races of seagoing folk and the English and Dutch captains vied with the sailors of Spain and Portugal. No captains were more prosperous than the mariners of Antwerp. In 1568 there were 500 marble mansions in this city on the Meurs. Belgium became a casket filled with jewels. Then it was that Spain turned covetous eyes northward, Sated with his pleasures, broken by indulgence and passion, the Emperor Charles V resigned his gold and throne to his son, King Philip. Finding his coffers depleted, Philip sent the Duke of Alva, with 10,000 Spanish soldiers, out on a looting expedition. Their approach filled Antwerp with consternation for her merchants were busy with commerce and not with war. The sack of Antwerp by the Spaniards makes up a revolting page in history. Within three days, 8,000 men, women and children were massacred, and the Spanish soldiers, drunk with wine and blood, hacked, drowned and burned like fiends that they were. The Belgian historian tells us that 500 marble residences were reduced to blackened ruins. One incident will make the event stand out. When the Spaniards approached the city, a wealthy burgher hastened the day of his son's marriage. During the ceremony, the soldiers broke down the gate of the city and crossed the threshold of the rich man's house. When they had stripped the guests of their purses and gems, unsatisfied, they killed the bridegroom, slew the men, and carried the bride out into the night. The next morning, a young woman, crazed and half-clad, was found in the street, searching among the dead bodies. At last she found a youth, whose head she lifted upon her knees, over which she crooned her songs, as a young mother soothes her babe. A Spanish officer passing by, humiliated by the spectacle, ordered a soldier to use his dagger and put the girl out of her misery. The Horrors of the Inquisition Having looted Antwerp, the treasure chest of Belgium, the Spaniards set up the Inquisition as an organized means of securing property. It is the strange fact that the Spaniard has excelled in cruelty as other nations have excelled in art or science or invention. Spain's cruelty to the Moors and the rich Jews forms one of the blackest chapters in history. Inquisitors became fiends. Moors were starved, tortured, burned, flung in wells. Jewish bankers had their tongues thrust through little iron rings. Then the end of the tongue was seared that it might swell, and a banker was led by a string in the ring through the streets of the city. The women and the children were put on rafts that were pushed out into the Mediterranean Sea. When the swollen corpses drifted ashore, the plague broke out.
and when that black plague spread over Spain, it seemed like the justice of outraged nature. The expulsion of the Moors was one of the deadliest blows ever struck at science, commerce, art, and literature. The historian tracks Spain across the continents by a trail of blood. Wherever Spain's hand has fallen, it has paralyzed. From the days of Cortes, wherever her captains have given a pledge, the tongue that spake has been mildewed with lies and treachery. The wildest beasts are not in the jungle. Man is the lion that rends. Man is the leopard that tears. Man's hate is the serpent that poisons. And the Spaniard entered Belgium to turn a garden into a wilderness. Within one year, 1568, Antwerp, that began with 125,000 people, ended it with 50,000. Many multitudes were put to death by the sword and stake, but many, many thousands fled to England to begin anew their lives as manufacturers and mariners. And for years Belgium was one quaking peril an inferno whose torturers were Spaniards. The visitor in Antwerp is still shown the rack upon which they stretched the merchants that they might yield up their hidden gold. The painted lady may be seen. Opening her arms, she embraces the victim. The Spaniard, with his spear, forced the merchant into the deadly embrace. As the iron arms concealed in velvet folded together, one spike passed through each eye, another through the mouth, another through the heart. The painted lady's lips were poisoned, so that a kiss was fatal. The dungeon whose sides were forced together by screws, so that each day the victim saw his cell growing less and less, and knew that soon he would be crushed to death, was another instrument of torture. Literally thousands of innocent men and women were burned alive in the marketplace. There is no more piteous tragedy in history than the story of the decline and ruin of this superbly prosperous literary and artistic country. And yet out of the ashes came new courage. Burned, broken, the Belgians and the Dutch were not beaten. Pushed at last into Holland, where they united their fortunes with the Dutch, they cut the dikes of Holland and let in the ocean, and clinging to the dikes with their fingertips, fought their way back to the land. But no sooner had the last of the Spaniards gone than out of their rags and poverty, they founded a university as a monument to the providence of God in delivering them out of the hands of their enemies. For... The 16th century, in the form of a brave knight, wears little Belgium and Holland like a red rose upon his heart. The Death of Egmont But some of you will say that the Belgian people must have been rebels and guilty of some excess, and that had they remained quiescent and not fermented treason, then no such fate could have overtaken them at the hands of Spain. Very well. I will take a youth who, at the beginning, believed in Charles V, a man who was as true to his ideals as the needle to the pole. One day, the bloody council decreed the death of Egmont and Horn. Immediately afterward, the Duke of Alva sent an invitation to Egmont to be the guest of honor at a banquet in his own house. A servant from the palace that night delivered to the Count a slip of paper containing a warning to take the fleetest horse and flee the city, and from that moment not to eat or sleep without pistols at his hand. To all this, Egmont responded that no monster ever lived 
who could, with an invitation of hospitality, trick a patriot. Like a brave man, the Count went to the Duke's palace. He found the guests assembled, but when he had handed his hat and cloak to the servant, Alva gave a sign, and from behind the curtains came Spanish musketeers, who demanded his sword, for instead of a banquet hall, the Count was taken to a cellar, fitted up as a dungeon. Already Egmont had all but died for his country. He had used his ships, his trade, his gold for righting the people's wrongs. He was a man of a large family, a wife and eleven children, and people loved him as to idolatry. But Alva was inexorable. He had made up his mind that the merchants and burghers had still much hidden gold, and if he killed their bravest and best, terror would fall upon all alike, and that the gold he needed would be forthcoming. That all the people might witness the scene, he took his prisoners to Brussels and decided to behead them in the public square. In the evening, Egmont received the notice that his head would be chopped off the next day. A scaffold was erected in the public square. That evening, he wrote a letter that is a marvel of restraint. Sire, I have learned this evening the sentence which your majesty has been pleased to pronounce upon me. Although I have never had a thought, and believe myself never to have done a deed, which would tend to the prejudice of your service, or to the detriment of true religion, nevertheless I take patience to bear that which it has pleased the good God to permit. Therefore, I pray your majesty to have compassion on my poor wife, my children, and my servants, having regard to my past service, in which hope I now commend myself to the mercy of God. From Brussels, ready to die, this 5th of June, 1568, La Morale d'Egmont. Thus died a man who did as much probably for Holland as John Eliot for England, or Lafayette for France, or Samuel Adams for this young republic. The Woe of Belgium And now, out of all this glorious past, comes the Woe of Belgium. Desolation has come like the whirlwind, and destruction like a tornado. But ninety days ago, and Belgium was a hive of industry, and in the fields were heard the harvest songs. Suddenly, Germany struck Belgium. The whole world has but one voice. Belgium has innocent hands. She was led like a lamb to the slaughter. When the lover of Germany is asked to explain Germany's breaking of her solemn treaty upon the neutrality of Belgium, the German stands dumb and speechless. Merchants honor their written obligations. True citizens consider their word as good as their bond. Germany gave treaty, and in the presence of God and the civilized world, entered into a solemn covenant with Belgium. To the end of time, the German must expect this taunt as worthless as a German treaty. Scarcely less black, the two or three known examples of cruelty wrought upon non-resisting Belgians. In Brooklyn lives a Belgian woman. She planned to return home in late July to visit a father who had suffered paralysis, an aged mother, and a sister who nursed both. When the Germans decided to burn that village in eastern Belgium, they did not wish to burn alive this old and helpless man, so they bayoneted to death the old man and woman, and the daughter that nursed them. Let us judge not that we be not judged. This is the one example of atrocity that you and I might be able personally to prove. But every loyal German in the country can make answer, these soldiers were drunk with wine and blood. 
Such an atrocity misrepresents Germany and her soldiers. The breaking of Germany's treaty with Belgium represents the dishonesty of a military ring, and not the perfidy of sixty-eight million of people. We ask that judgment be postponed until all the facts are in. But, meanwhile, the man who loves his fellows at midnight in his dreams walks across the fields of broken Belgium. All through the night air there comes the sob of Rachel, weeping for her children, because they are not. In moods of bitterness, of doubt and despair, the heart cries out, How could a just God permit such cruelty upon innocent Belgium? No man knows. Clouds and darkness are round about God's throne. The spirit of evil calls this war, but the spirit of God may bring good out of it, just as the summer can repair the ravages of winter. Meanwhile, the heart bleeds for Belgium, for Brussels, the third most beautiful city in Europe, for Louvain, once rich with its libraries, cathedrals, statues, paintings, missals, manuscripts, now a ruin. Alas for the ruined harvests and the smoking villages. Alas for the cathedral that is a heap and the library that is a ruin. Where the angel of happiness was there stalk famine and death. Gone the land of Grotius. Perish the paintings of Rubens. Ruined is Levain. Where the wheat waved, now the hillsides are billowy with graves. But let us believe that God reigns. Perchance Belgium is slain like the Saviour, that militarism may die like Satan. Without shedding of innocent blood, there is no remission of sins through tyranny and greed. There is no wine without the crushing of the grapes from the tree of life. Soon liberty, God's dear child, will stand within the scene and comfort the desolate. Falling upon the great world's altar stairs, in this hour when wisdom is ignorance and the strongest man clutches at dust and straw, let us believe with faith, victorious over tears, that some time God will gather broken-hearted little Belgium into his arms and comfort her as a father comforteth his well-beloved child. End of section 35